I want to start by introducing myself. My name is Nick Martorelli. I am an audiobook producer at Penguin Random House Audio, and I oversee the production of our audiobooks, including all of the Star Wars books that we publish. Penguin Random House is going to do about 1,400 audiobooks this year. No big deal. Um, <laughs> maybe two dozen of them being Star Wars books. So that's what we are here to talk about today. And I have with me a uh, panel of actors, writers, narrators. That's all three of them. Yep. And I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves and uh, tell a little bit about why they're part of the discussion. Sure. Uh, my name is Janina Gavankar. I play Aiden Versio, commander of Inferno Squad in the Star Wars galaxy. Uh, and I was lucky enough to... <laughs> Um, I, was, I was lucky enough to be able to narrate Battlefront II, Inferno Squad, the backstory to my character, which was written by Ms. Christy Golden. Hi, I'm Catherine Tabor, and um, I have had the honor of playing Padme Amidala for the last 10 years. Um, and so you can imagine my excitement when I found out they were doing a Padme book and hoping that they were going to call and ask me to do it. <laughs> um, and they did, written by the wonderful E.K. Johnston. And so I narrated Queen's Shadow, and that is why I am here. <laughs> my name's Kevin Scott. I write um, oodles of Star Wars, depending on um, comics books, various things. I've been writing audio drama for 20 years um, back in the UK on such series as Doctor Who, Highlander, but, um, quite a lot, really. Um, but most importantly, <laughs> unless there's someone here from the BBC, um, <laughs> I have written recently Dooku Jedi Lost, um, which came out um, in April. Sweet. Dooku Jedi Lost, our first audio original Star Wars project that was written, Kevin wrote it as a script, and it was produced with a full cast, full sound effects, uh, very much in the style of the old NPR radio shows, of which I am a big fan. Um, so I want to sort of just start off lightly by asking everyone up here, sort of like how you got into Star Wars. Like, do you remember a first encounter with oh, it? Oh, growing up? Yeah, yeah, uh, like a very, before you were involved, involved. Mm-hmm. Can start? Kevin? Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> Do it. Tell us. For me, it was not the films. It was the Marvel comics um, back in the 70s. Oh, um, in UK, we had um, Mar um, Star Wars Weekly when they reprinted the comics. Um, and I picked up an issue of that, which had Han Solo, Chewbacca, and Jackson, the big green space rabbit. Um, a few months later, I saw Empire Strikes Back and was very upset that Jackson, the big green space <laughs> rabbit, was not in the film, but they put Han Solo in, duh, you know. Um, so yeah, that was the beginning. And then I saw the films and that was it, I was done for. Did you try to put him in your book? Oh yeah, I, I, we, a couple of years ago, we brought um, Jackson back. From, yes, because that's canon. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so yeah, Jackson lives. <laughs> I, um, I always say, like, I don't have some amazing Star Wars first story. I just remember Star Wars always being there. So mm. I usually tell Dee Baker's first story of how he was a Jawa at his local movie theater when the movie was opening because it's such a cute story. And I, I don't really have one. It was just always, always there. So I was always a fan. It was always a part of my life. And so it's been a real blessing to get to work in the galaxy. <laughs> uh, I was so nerdy that I didn't even have like pop culture growing up. I had a very strict upbringing and I was not allowed to watch things and I just practiced a lot of instruments. So when I got to junior high, my best friend Ryan Perella at the time, he was like, what do you mean you haven't seen Star Wars? And uh, sat me down and made me watch all of them and I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> I, I had no idea what I was missing um, and then um, I mean, like, I, I can't pretend that I thought that there was a space for me in the galaxy. I just didn't. So I, I never dreamt that I would be a part of it. Um, so, you know, being here with all of you now is just still, like, two years later, it's like, how is this real? <laughs> so let me ask you about that. How did you guys get involved in the galaxy that very, very first time? Start this way this week? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know... 
I'm, I don't know if a lot of you know this. Are there gamers in the room right now? Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. Cool, 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 cool. Great, great, great. So um, I'm sure you, you know this. Sometimes when you audition for something you don't know, they don't tell you what it is unless you read NeoGAF like a crazy person like I do and no, and I have like have my ear to the ground constantly. I'm just always listening. So when I, um, when this hit my desk, I was like, I know what this is. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody had said that there was going to be a story mode, but I was like, obviously there's a story mode. That's the only thing that makes sense for the extension of Battlefront. And, um, <laughs> and they were made up sides and, uh, I just, you know, I, I listen. This is the only thing, the only gig where I was called my my team every day after and like cried most days. Like, if I don't get this, I really don't know what I'm gonna do. Like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Like, it, I, it meant so much to me because it was a medium that I love so much, and you know, obviously, uh, you know, the uh, a protagonist in a Star Wars story. Holy shit. <laughs> Um, so my first Star Wars experience was also a game. Um, I like to say it was my second voiceover audition. My first one was for Papa John's Pizza, which I did not get. <laughs> um, they say protection is, no, no, rejection is protection, <laughs> yes. Um, but uh, I got the role of a character named Mission Veo in a game called Knights of the Old Republic. And, yeah. um, and so my whole career has been, um, it's been, filled with Star Wars, which again, as a fan, has been like just the biggest blessing. And, um, and that was, so she was my first foray wow. into Star Wars. <laughs> um, for me, I was back home writing, I say a lot of Doctor Who at the time. Um, they were producing a new series of children's books, um, which were going to be produced in the UK, set between the um, Clone Wars and the um, original trilogy. And they wanted someone to write for, to create this little family who would be on the run for the Empire um, and they contacted my agent because I'd written some middle grade Doctor Who stuff recently and obviously I bit their hand off and anyone else's hand who was in the room um, <laughs> and it was at San Diego four years ago I found oh, out wow. where I was doing it um, and that was Adventures in Wild Space which was the beginning of, of four years of writing Star Wars which has been incredible. So now that you've are in, now that you've gotten involved in the galaxy I'm going to pivot our discussion into the actual audiobooks. So I'm going to start with you, Janina, because the <laughs> audiobook you read, Battle Fr Inferno Squad, Battlefront 2. I feel like it's the other way around. Battlefront 2, colon, Inferno Squad. You are correct. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Inferno Squad <laughs> is the backstory of Aiden yeah. for the video game. Yeah. So we, uh, I knew the book was coming. So my job as the producer is to read the books and then decide which actor is best for the project. Do we need more than one actor? Do, should it be a man? Should it be a woman? Like, what's the background? Like, that is my job. And then scheduling them into a studio, making sure they finish it, making sure they all record it on time, and it gets delivered to everywhere it needs to go. It is also my job to hire a director who is going to be with the reader for all of the book. They're the ones who have prepared it, done the uh, research about how to say all the names, figured out sort of like what the tone of the book should be, and they also put in all the music and the sound effects and sort of pace it out as a final product. So the book is coming, and we talked to, I talked to you about getting you to read it, because it is yeah, yeah. all about Aiden. It's her backstory. Yes. But um, there are also a thousand people in the book. There are. There are people in the book that are not in the game, too. Yep. And there are people in the book that are in the game. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all younger in the book than they are in the game. Yes. So I guess my question, and then I'll come to you, Kat, with similar ones, is like, so once you got that job, what was your process like? How did you approach it? Well, it was like, uh, I just was like, yes, 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 yes. And then I was like, terror. Uh, it was like an immediate, I think I got off the phone and I was like, oh, God. And then, um, you know, what have I done? Um, and then... You know, I had to sandwich this book into the schedule, the Battlefront 2 schedule, because we were still shooting the game, and I was doing, um, I was doing all of the motion capture and then doing a ton of in-game dialogue as well, so my schedule was super intense, and I was shooting a movie as well, so I was like, th there was only a few days when I could do this book, and so I had very little time to prep, and it was the first 
<laughs> audiobook I'd ever done. And it was ridiculous. Okay, so I was scared, and then I talked to you, and I was like, wait, so hold on. Like, I listened to a few things, and like, I heard this one book. What was it called? Uh, the Princess, the Scoundrel, and the Farm Boy. Yeah, so two narrators there. Dude does all the voices. Girl does all the female voices. Dude does all the dude voices. Woman does all the female voices. Fine. I was like, that's what we should do. We should also do that because... I'm, not, I'm a lady, and also a lot of these voices are people I work with, like I'm working with them on the game, so like we should just get one of them. This is a great idea, we should do this. And you said, no. No. No, you're doing them all. <laughs> just do them all. And I was like, shit, I thought, I thought this was a great idea. I thought we were gonna really nail this pitch. No? Okay, <laughs> all right, fine. Um, it was terrifying. It was super scary, but also because like, yes, it's one thing to do voices for people that um, so you're, now you're doing like an imitation of, of people that we know and love. Horrible. And then now I'm also doing some approximation of people that I work with. Like I'm going to see them the next day at work. So bad. Horrible. So uh, I was just like, I'm never going to send them a link to this thing. <laughs> I hope they never hear me do them. Um, so, yeah, but I had to, like, do Paul Blackthorne, who I've known for a really long time. Uh, we've done th three projects together, uh, and that was, like, I, I don't even know how I got into it. I was like, well, it was, like, me doing some, like, bad version of Sean Connery it was me getting into Paul Blackthorne. Um, anyway, it was hilarious. Um, but I lived. <laughs> well, you also had characters in the book who were not in the game, so you yes. were making up characters as well. You were making up character voices yeah, in addition I was. to matching them. Yeah, um, yeah, now, I don't know if you guys know who Sam Witwer is, but he is a walking encyclopedia. Um, he is the keeper. He is a walking tome. Um, he is the archive and uh, a national treasure, therefore. Um, and Darth Maul. And also Darth Maul. Um, <laughs> And also Palpatine, like he's so many people, y'all. Anyway, so um, he was very kind when it was announced that I was doing um, the game. He just basically volunteered as tribute to be my encyclopedia. And uh, I was like, I'm gonna take you up on that new buddy. And so for this, he helped me build a lot of those people and, and figure out like, I was like, I don't, how do I even find, it was a giant list. I was like, who is this person? There's no, this is such a deep cut. And he was like, oh, that's so-and-so from this book. And like, he's like, <laughs> he's Wikipedia. So um, he would give me all these references and he made it so much easier. And, uh, but yeah, I mean like, you know, and the other thing is you don't always know everything. You don't know if a character exists in this book that is from something that hasn't been released yet. So you better not say them with an English accent if an, another person's already been cast, like sometimes you just, you have to trust your director. Trust your director. And we have that, uh, we have that experience a lot actually. We were doing Last Shot by Daniel Jose Older and the book came out something like three or four weeks before Solo. And L3 was in the book. So oh my God. we had to basically guess what L3's performance would feel like in the film in order to do the audiobook. And we had, you know, we, we, we were able to get sort of voice samples, uh, sound effect references and things like that. But it was the sort of thing like we're both aiming at the same target as yeah. we're going. Unlike, say, a character that Catherine played in Queen's Shadow, the Emperor. Well, Senator, <laughs> Senator Palpatine. <laughs> Someone who is, you know, we all know what the emperor sounds like. We oh. all have that impression that we do at parties when we... <laughs> yeah. um, but Catherine, for your experience, you were playing... The book is all about Amidala. Yes. And it also has all of these other characters in it. So could you talk a little bit about your preparation for that? So um, I had already done a few audiobooks. So I have a sort of process that I, I do... Um, but like Janina said, it's weird because when you're doing a Star Wars book, these characters already exist, and a lot of times you're friends with the people that play them, mm -hmm. so it's, a, it's definitely more of a, a you know, scary situation. But I do visuals um, to keep track of everything. So like with The Handmaidens, you know, thank God for the internet. Like you go in and I just take pictures and I put them on a piece of paper um, with their name and I'll maybe make a note about like, 
you know, Dorme is more this way and Corday is more this way. Um, and then any of the characters that I, you know, needed to have a visual for. And so it was really funny too. It's funny that she's here because there's a character in Queen Shadow named Mary Eck and um, I couldn't, she doesn't exist. And I couldn't find a picture of, so I was just looking for a random woman or a Star Wars woman that was that character in my head. So I actually used a picture of Janina and, and Aiden. And then I, at one point, just being crafty, posted on Instagram, you know, the picture of my little stand with my lip gloss and my water and everything. And it, you could see the, you could see my character sheet. And people were like, is Aiden in Queen Shadow? This is, this is. <laughs> It's a slippery slope, girl. <laughs> and I was like, no, 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 she's not. The rumors. She's not. I know. It was so funny. I was like, no, she's not. Um, or is she? Yes, or is yeah. she? But that's how I do it. Like, I have to, um, and it's really a safety net. Like, after a while, you don't need to use it, but I can look over there and be like, okay, this is who I am right now. Um, and it helps figure out, you know, and keep things clear. It's like casting. It's like what you do. Mm -hmm. In terms of like, try, once you sort of pin somebody in your mind in terms yeah. of the performance, then you can refer to them whether they are a real person yeah. or whether they're... And I use, I use real actors sometimes too, like for a completely different book, I used Kathy Bates and then it's just like me doing an impersonation of Kathy Bates being this character. It just helps like mm -hmm. solidify the differences between people. But, but mm -hmm. doing Palpatine was hysterical. That was the one with the director. He was like, can you get a little lower? And I was like... No. No, no. <laughs> His voice, I mean, it makes you really even appreciate more other people's voices and the resonance mm. that just happens, like, you know, and I'm like, yeah, it's not in my wheelhouse. So I, I tried to do, you know, the essence of him, but um, didn't actually sound like him. <laughs> Both of your books also have a lot of people pretending to be other people in them. Um, Janina, in your case, it's a lot, it's, the Inferno Squad undercover, and Cat, it's a lot of, well, the handmaidens pretending to be Amidala, but also um, the book makes a distinction between their Senate voice and their home voice, yeah. and like a very sort of cultured experience. Yeah. And in any other media, you would have, you would be able to do that with your body, or with your face, or with anything. So like, what was your approach to sort of doing that strictly with your voice, or strictly for this audio book? For me, um, E.K. did such a beautiful job writing the book, and that, I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. um, the narration is really only as good as the writing. Mm -hmm. um, and when it's written in a way that the characters are defined, even just the simplest ways and differentiated, that's, you know, it's already there, and you just make the effort to remember who they are when you're, when you're doing it. And she, she did such a great job of writing these characters and making them homogenous but also really unique that I just had to read her words. <laughs> um, mine is pretty physical, actually. I have to sort of like, and then like get into a, a version like some, some um, stance or some version of them that activates muscles that makes me, that puts me in a certain place. But I was just thinking of a, par, a point that you didn't ask at all, but I'm just going to bring up. Fair. Um, I just worked on another audiobook that will remain nameless and um, was not in the galaxy at all. <laughs> and um, they were very particular about, um, okay, when the characters speak, they speak in that character, but when you are reading anything that is not in a quote, you do not put any opinion on it and that's super hard, y'all. <laughs> because my training is like, you make a choice. Everything that comes out of your mouth, everything that is in your body is a choice, is a person, is a living, real thing. So to be blank in that way was incredibly hard and not what I did in this book. Again, it was the first one I've ever done, so I didn't know any better anyway. But um, you guys allowed me to have a really emotional experience. I mean, there's this whole section of you know, Iden's backstory that, like, if I talk about it now, I will cry because it's so heartbreaking, her relationship with her mother. And when I read that part of the book, I was completely choked up. I could hardly get through it. And, like, there is definitely a moment when you, I had, like, tears rolling down my face as I'm reading these paragraphs, and you guys just let me do it. 
Well, and I think this also ties back to the writing because that book yeah, and exactly. both of those books That's are so sort of like close in on those characters yeah. that to pull too far away would sort of dis distance us a little bit too much from the experience. So I like what both of you did for those books and by keeping us very much in there and separating out the dialogue. Yeah. Kevin. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Speaking about <laughs> being very close within characters' points of view, mm -hmm. you wrote Dooku Jedi Lost as a... <laughs> Uh, as with Asajj Ventress as the narrator. Yes. And uh, with Count Dooku doing various hollow journals and hollow narrations as well. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of the approach of that? You didn't, you didn't have the narrative framework to rely on. No. No, and we, we, we wanted it to be a, a proper you know, audio drama. And of course, you can, ha you can have first-person narration um, in audio drama. It's a, you know, a, a useful thing to do. Um, so... That in itself is different from most Star Wars fiction, that it's not first person. Um, and basically I was given a, I'm gonna really name drop now. I, I, yep. was, at, I was at Skywalker Ranch. Excuse um, me. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I, it was, I was working, there's a, a, a little thing I'm working on called Project Luminous at the minute um, for Star Wars, um, which we've been talking about a bit, but not really saying what it is um, for reasons. And, I was there for the first retreat we had when we were, the writers were first getting together. And as, I, as everyone was leaving, they were all leaving before me because I was getting a plane back to Heathrow um, and my plane was later. So I was waving everyone off as if I was owning Skywalker Ranch. <laughs> You'll come back now. Um, and I said to Mike Seglane at Lucasfilm, oh, and when I get back, he said, what are you doing when you get back to London? I was like, I've got a week off. I've got some time you know, to relax and think about all this. And he was like, yeah, sure you have. And I was like, what? And he was like, nothing. Um, <laughs> And as his car drove off, an email arrived on my phone saying, by the way, we want you to do an audio drama. And I was like, oh, how am I going to do that? I haven't got time to do that. And then I scrolled down and went, we want you to tell the life story of Count Dooku. I was like, well, obviously I'm going to do that. Um, <laughs> and I opened up the attachment. And it was, it was a list of suggestions of where we could go with the story. And one of the things they said, you know, it, it wants, they wanted it to be you know, eight, six, seven, eight hours long. Um, and to tell his life story. And I, it didn't really dawn on me then. What they meant was from when he was 10 Ooh. to the age of 60, um, when he leaves the Jedi Order, which is a long time, um, where a lot happens. And so, again, there was these li the suggestions of the where we could take it, the Jedi we could have him involved with. Um, and that was wow. pretty much it. It was pretty much a blank canvas, because actually, if you look in canon, especially at Dooku, he is pretty, you know, we know him as the, the, the Sith. We know him as the traitor. We know him as the Separatist leader. We don't really know why. We have an idea of why he left, but, you know, it was pretty much, it was pretty much, really, you know, it, he, he existed to play that role. So we really started thinking about this. And the whole idea of going from a youngling through, because then, then we suddenly realized we've never really seen, especially in canon, Jedi training from the age of 10. We've seen Padawans, we've seen Masters of Padawans, but we've never seen the structure of, of what it, life would be like in the temple. Um, and so then things started to click in, and you know, and, and yeah, it was daunting. It was like, you know, 50 years of the guy's life. And also not to tell his fall to the dark side, which is a very gradual thing, so it's obviously all there. But this is Dooku as a Jedi, and you think again, you take a step back and you go, this guy, they're shocked when he turns out to be a Sith. They're all, you know, they don't know why he left. Um, and they all respect him. When Obi-Wan first meets him, you know, that's my master's master, you know, there's a respect there. Um, so it was, yeah, it was starting to build that through. And then the thing that really was the clinch for me when I saw Sifo Dias's name mentioned on the list, here's someone you might want to have in a scene. And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. We might want to have him all the way through. Um, but again, how then do you tell, a, you know, they only wanted six and a half hours and I had, you know, five decades to tell. So, you know, that could have been a long recording session, really. <laughs> it, it already was, yeah. but it could have just, just been longer. Um, and yeah, and one of the other ideas was, you know, why don't you have Ventress um, and Dooku training and, da and Dooku sort of telling her what happens. But again, Dooku's not the kind of guy that would go, let me open up to you. Um, so that's when the idea came of her investigating him. 
And also, you have the best unreliable narrator in the world um, with Ventress, who you know, starts the story by saying, I hate it here. Um, and that's pretty much her attitude through the entire thing. Um, and so it gave us a chance to explore her as well in a pretty dark path of her life. I mean, it's fair to say, no one in that story ends well, you know, so, <laughs> and that was what you're going into. But because of that, you have to make sure that people liked, still like the characters on the way, especially Ventress, who at the point, as I say, is in a bleak period of her life. It starts and ends with Ventress talking about how much she hates it here. <laughs> yeah. And I always, when I first read it, like, uh, when I first read it, I took those, those pages around and showed them to my boss, because this was the first thing we were doing. We were trying to figure out how this audio drama thing would work. And I took those pages in, and I was like, it's noir. Like, it's Star <laughs> Wars oh, noir. And that is made for radio. It's made yeah. for being said out loud. Yeah. So I was like, this is absolutely going to work. 100% trust me on this. We've it's absolutely this. noir. Yeah. I mean, it's noir via... Harry Potter a bit, uh, you know. Um, but yeah, there's a reason that halfway through she's sitting on the roof in the ra in the roof in the rain, mm -hmm. watching what's going on because I really we really wanted to lean into that. You know, the old time radio thing of Sherlock Holmes and the Phantom and the Shadow, especially the Shadow. Um, so yeah, that was really important for us. So we talked a little bit with uh, with Janina and Kat about new characters versus familiar characters, and you have that in in there as well. We have the familiar. Dooku, Yoda, Qui-Gon Jinn kind of thing, but we also have Lean, mm. we have Sifo Dyas, who's basically new in this audio piece. Um, and I know, that, uh, I know that a lot of people like Lean, yeah. Kastana, the, uh, the Jedi Master, who yeah. is... So if, if people haven't heard, um, Lean is someone that takes Dooku under a wing and a mentor. Now, Dooku is the is Yoda's Padawan, and so and Yoda's a, a busy green alien. Um, so there are times when he needs a trusted advisor to um, look after his Padawan, and he chooses the trusted advisor who is obsessed with Sith ar um, artifacts. And so um, the whole point of Lean is that she is a Jedi who believes the Sith are coming. She's sort of right, um, but the rest of the Jedi are going, "Don't be daft. We don't need to worry about that." And she, she is. We need to train these kids that if they see something they know what's coming. Um, and so she takes Dooku under a wing and, and trains him um, to follow that path as well, leading him into areas that perhaps he shouldn't have been going. Um, not because she's in no way dark side herself, but she is worried about what's coming. She can um, feel it coming um, in the air. Um, and she was amazing because, again, she is a character that she was in a few scenes. And she wasn't, spoiler, she's in it right towards the, to the end. And she wasn't in the last third when we originally planned it. Um, when um, Dooku leaves, there was someone else with him. Um, but actually, it made more sense. She was growing. And that's the wonderful thing about writing. And I think especially for writing drama as well and writing scripts, you start having characters that really start to take a life of their own. It's a cliche, but that's because of what happens. Um, and yeah, and Aline Castana has become a, a breakout character of it. Um, it was, she was breakout for us when we were writing her. And, I know there is now talk of, well, what, what do we do with her now that she's out there? Because originally, she died. It's true. Um, and then we felt, we were like, no, she shouldn't, because, because she has a life. Um, and, and it was that thing, is actually, she was dying because the plot sort of said that someone might die, and it was, it was too easy. And so it was more, it was more interesting to, to say, she survives that moment and carries on. And I'm so glad we made that call. I'm going to go back to audiobook studio talk. Like, <laughs> what is it like actually recording one of these Star Wars audiobooks? Like, what is a day? What do you do? You go to the studio, you sit in the booth, you put on your headphones for how long in a typical day? Okay. It's like seven hours. Over like three or four days, right? Probably. Yes. Yeah. And, and you know, for perspective on other voiceover jobs, the longest session that you would ever normally do is four hours. Um, and, and often you're not even doing a full four hours. But with the book, you are pretty much barreling through. I mean, they let you out for lunch. But other than that, <laughs> you're, you're, you're really going through. And it, it, it can be quite exhausting. I don't know if you found it that way. Oh, yeah. So we have a mutual friend who uh, is laureled in the audiobook world and he uh, he's the first person I called 
and he said that his favorite director says that making an audiobook, performing an audiobook is like pushing a boulder up a mountain with your face. <laughs> and um, he's right. Yeah. It's tough. Um, but if you're the type of person that's like, give me a challenge, let me, let me see if I can pull this off, then you're, you know, you're in the right medium. <laughs> And we did this panel at Celebration, and then um, um, Mark Thompson and I were talking and both saying the same experience that we had as actors and then forgetting that our producer was here and he might not hire us again. But, um, but basically, like, there's this moment on day one where you're, like, the day is ending and you're, you're like, exhausted and it's, it's, you know, you feel like you're giving birth. Well, I've never given birth, but I sort of imagine. And, <laughs> and then you look and you're like, what, what page did we get to? And, you know, your director's like, uh, 72. Um, and you're like, <laughs> what? And you just, you're like, I, 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 I don't think I'll be able to finish this. I, 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 I don't think I can do this. And I literally, I've done 20 books now. And I still, unless it's a children's book and it's really short, I still have that moment. And then you go home and you get some sleep and you wake up and then it's, it's all better. But it's, it's very daunting. And the Star Wars books are even more so. But thank you for hiring me after I said that. Oh, you're, you're, welcome. you're welcome. welcome. And you've do just doubled down on it again. I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, I said this once before. I super mean it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's, ha it's hard. It's hard. And I mean, it sounds like so babyish to be like, oh, it's so hard to be an actor. Um, but this is. But this the, listen, tough. like I'm actually, I'm used to doing 16-hour days on set. You know, like you're in the chair at five in the morning. You drive yourself to work, and you don't leave until. I mean, like these, I'm used to that. This is harder. Um, it's also super inspiring, and your brain does things that you're that it just never gets asked to do when you're playing one person, even in a really big fancy movie. You know, it's just it's completely different experience um, but to pretend that it's not really difficult is like it's just a lie you know yeah that's my next note here actually if it's so hard what's rewarding about it if it's so hard then why are you being a, ba no, I'm just being <laughs> no, a baby like, about this I mean because w when I talk to new narrators or when I talk to an author who might want to read their book the one thing that I often stress is just the sheer stamina involved yeah the idea that like you know we all can read to our kids going to sleep or to, you know, that seems like fine. I read an email out loud at a meeting the other day. But, like, this is seven hours of sitting in this, basically in the same chair in a room the size of one of these tables. So, like, it is a very different kind of mental focus and, and, and stamina for it. And you don't get to, this is one of the things when um, actors who haven't done it before first do it that's really difficult. You can't make anything precious. And, you know, if you're doing mm. a film... Um, or a TV show or something, you have a certain amount of lines and you know you can maybe say them several different times in different ways and play around. But when you're doing a book, you just can't keep doing the same line even if you don't feel like it was perfect. You have to just keep going. You just go, got it, next. And you it's just the keep nature going. of it. And, and you don't get to do a lot of rehearsal or anything, so you just have to go through. But the rewarding part, like for me, again, like as someone who started this whole adventure as an actor and someone who loves to tell stories, I love books and there is something about being involved and bringing a book to life in that way. It's that the writing. It yeah, it's always it, comes down to the writing. It's completely different than any other kind of acting because you really do get to be all these characters mm -hmm. that you would never get to play otherwise, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and tell you know, if the book is good, which I've done, I've been blessed to do good books, and, and tell a story. And my parents, honestly, they are always the most proud of my audiobooks, no oh. matter what else I've done. My dad will be like, I don't know how you do that. I don't know how you do that. And, uh, and as an actor, you do feel challenged, and so it's, it's really rewarding. It's a really intimate experience. Um, and it's as close as you can get. I mean, you know what it feels like when you're curled up with a book. It's really intimate. It's like, it's like sharing some kind of weird mind meld with an author, you know? Um, and you, we get to do that. I want to ask you, Kevin, because we're talking all about the... Oh, can we just say something? Kevin, 
That's like the most Star Wars name yep, ever. Really. <laughs> Janina's not exactly yeah, you're right. Star Wars Janina Gavonkars. Yeah, one of the first tweets I, I saw when I was like announced was like, wait, which one is the Star Wars name? I was like, yeah. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> the trouble fine. is, with my accent, I would be in the Imperial Navy. Yes, you know, so. yes, you would. <laughs> I'd be dead eventually. And speaking of, doesn't Nick look like a young George Lucas? <gasps> oh, <laughs> all of our hearts just went, oh. <laughs> It's a good thing. It's a good thing. Yes, yes. What were we talking about? Uh, <laughs> I feel like I want to ask you a different question okay. now uh, that we've made an Imperial Navy joke. Um, so we were talking about all the writing, and the and, uh, the writers, Christy and, 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 and E.K., when they write these books, they give them to us, and I feel very lucky that they, the, you know, the Star Wars property just sort of entrusts us with the process and the things that we can create and the things that we come up with. Kevin, you're the one who is trusting us. So I want to ask you about the Dooku script. Mm -hmm. And like, was there any spoilers? Was there any scene that you wrote? And as you're writing it, you're either going, I can't wait to hear this. Or you're also thinking, I have no idea how they're going to do this. Um, well, it's interesting because I, I write prose. I write scripts for both comics and, and radio. And always unless I'm talking to one of my prose commission and editors, um, scripts are my favorite. Because it's, when you write prose, it's you and your editor and, you know, and, and the various people involved in writing a book. But when you're writing a script for whether it's a comic or for a, a screenplay or a drama, um, it's a collaboration. You know, there are so many people involved. And, and the script is the starting point, but then you, you give it away. And, I mean, there have been times when I, I've, I've been in recordings because I used to produce audio as well, so back home I, I, I'm often there. With this, it was a complete case of, I knew you were doing it quite quickly as well, and it, it was going to be handover, and then that was it. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to know. Um, the scene that I think I wanted to hear was, again, spoilers, Dooku leaves the Jedi Order. Um, <laughs> and there was a point that we talked about loads and it changed so much is the point where Yo he tells Yoda he's going and it went through so many different variations and in the end we, we decided to go for one of the most intimate moments um, in the play I think and I was dying to hear that and it was one I actually got quite emotional hearing it because there's a bit that's not scripted is where I'm going to spoil this basically <laughs> Dooku has to phone in because Yoda's not there. So he has to send a hologram to, the, to Yoda's quarters to say, I'm leaving. Um, and he, there's a line when he says, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to say this. Now, um, I will leave my lightsaber with Lean. And Yoda says, no, it's the weapon of a Jedi. Just because you're leaving the Order, you're still a Jedi. Um, and I wanted to hear that, and I thought that would be... He actually said it in Yoda speak, obviously. <laughs> I didn't want to do that. Um, I wanted to hear that, but the bit that got me was when Dooku's hologram fizzles away and Yoda sighs. And Aww. that was the moment that I got emotional. Oh. I'm going a bit now. Um, <laughs> and I'm Imperial, I don't. Um, but yeah, so it's moments like that. And there are always surprises. Avros's accent was a surprise. Um, <laughs> I, we sort of both, um, the, Avros was a character that I, um, well, it, I was working on. Um, Claudia Gray had created him for Master and Apprentice. Um, and we had the joy of writing both the stories at the same time and we could swap notes and we could swap characters. Um, and neither of us knew what he sounded like until we got the audio books. And it was, a, it was, it was we, I think Claudia thought he was Australian. Um, I had no idea really what he sounded like. And then when he came back, he's sort of a sort of Texas drawl kind of thing going on. Yeah, yeah. Sam Elliott is who yeah. we kept talking about yeah. in the room. I, going back to you guys talking about casting it as yeah. specific actors. What do you, what, what do you, like that, that's something interesting too. Like what is your part as a producer besides hiring us? Like what else do you do? Um, so what, <laughs> In, in, in this specific context, what I'll do is I'll hire a director, and the director is the one who is, the director and the actor are going to be the one sort of making those decisions as we go, and looking at the clues in the text to say, oh, this, you know, in a, in a non-Star Wars audiobook, something, 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 and there's a reference to this character, and they use a particularly southern turn of phrase, and they use that to sort of extrapolate out that this character might have a southern accent, and then they figure out how strong it is, how weak it is, what kind of English accent does someone have, how do you differentiate people who are appearing throughout the entire book, 
and you need a real clear, like Eli Vanto-esque kind of voice to them, or they are a Imperial Lieutenant on the other side of the bridge who has two lines, and you just need to differentiate them from everyone else in the scene, but not necessarily tag them for the rest of the program. Um, and with the 100 characters in Dooku, we had that kind of discussion all the time. It's like, oh, okay, you know, Saifa Diaz is all the way through, so let's think about sort of how he sounds in relation to the world, and then we get the Abyssins, and we're like, we need these guys to just vaguely sound uh, mean. <laughs> so, uh, okay, okay, Ewan, Mark, Sean, and Neil, who are playing the Abyss Abyssins, what accent can you all do? <laughs> because we all need you to do the same one. Yeah. So let's sort of start working from there and figure it, has, it all it out. And then, and then make it a little bit alien. You know, like take that next Star Wars step. You, you mentioned the 100 characters in Dooku. I do remember the conversation when I asked you, how you many characters am I allowed? And you went, how many do you want? I said as and many as And those words you. never happened. No. So I was like, we'll stop the conversation now. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, he knew, he knew not to ask me any follow-ups is yeah, what yeah, it yeah. was. Yeah. Um, wow. But I did, uh, I did give you some notes, Kevin, every once in a while that were like, I think we need more narration here. And yeah, yeah. Uh, I, know, I know at one point you made a joke. It's like, this is, is this starting to feel too... Meanwhile, at Gotham City... Yeah. Well, well, that's always, meanwhile, at Gotham City is my shorthand for this because I mean, I, I've written dra audio drama that has no narration and it's all dependent on the sound effects and, it, you know, and, it, and, it can work, and both can work. But yeah, there were points where... And that's... A, that's a personal choice as well. So there were notes saying we need something here. To, and I, 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 there'll be points when I push back and go, mm -hmm. I don't think so. I think we got the halfway house. And again, it's the collaboration, you know, that, and that's what we ended up with. Yeah, but meanwhile at Gotham City, it does happen a lot in these, in these kind of things. The expression I kept using in the recording session. So it took about, it would take about, let's say four days to record a 12 or 13 hour audio book. Um, and it took five days to record the six-hour Dooku because we had a full cast and we were sort of bringing people in and out. So it was a lot of sort of like logistical work around it all. And one of the things I kept saying about the script was that this script, unlike a book where we, we, we strive to be word perfect and get everything that's on the page in the audio, and this one, you're talking about the Yoda moment, mm. this one I kept saying that our script is the road map. Yeah, yeah. Like here is where we start and here is where we go. So if as, uh, as, and it was very interesting from an actor point of view because the first version of every action scene, Dooku and Saifa Diaz running from the Bacta or them sneaking into the, 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 uh, the Bogan collection, the first take was very uh, audiobook narrator where they're saying all of the words perfectly cleanly and clearly and in the correct order. And then we would tell them, just shake it out, loosen up and just sort of play a little bit more. And that's where you got I, those kind of things as yeah. they were talking, they overlapped each other, they sort of broke rhythm a little yeah. bit more. And it was sort of like that shaking from one mode into another mode of performance. Mm -hmm. And that's also where we got the Yoda sighing and the sort of like little, all the little pieces around the words which you had written for us. We were like, we can texture this even stronger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to ask, though, in terms of like we talked about, I just made the comparison of going from one form of acting to the other form of acting. So Kat and Janina, you've both played these characters in multiple versions, multiple forms of them. Mm -hmm. um, and Kat, in your case, you did the other form and then came to audiobooks. Janina, you were doing them both sort of at the same time. I think our first, I think that phone call was actually from the set when yeah. you were filming it. Um, so how did that sort of inflect a, across each other, playing well, it in one to the other? Ironically, so I found out there was a book being written about her backstory while I was on set, and I was livid that no one told me. I was actually v sort of like, I threw a sort, as close to an actor tiff as I've ever had. Like, you know, I'm not one of these, like, yeah. But I was like, oh, what? How could you not tell me? So you know. So you didn't know any of that information. Going I didn't know any of that information, role. and so I kind of I like stamped my foot pretty hard, um, and said, "How do we get Christy on Skype? Can we do this? How do I meet with her?" Um, actually, 
I already found her email. <laughs> like, I was that person about it. I was like, I'm going to do this whether you want me to or not. And, um, like, how do we make this happen? And then within a day, <laughs> we had a... Uh, we, we had like a closed door Skype session on a lunch break on set with um, our writers, our narrative director, and Christy, where she told me the entire backstory to Aiden, and I was like crying, and it was like, oh, God, like this, this makes so much sense, you know? It was really, um, it was incredible uh, to have, and I just got to put it right into the game. Um, and at that point, I had no idea that I was going to do the book. So, um, yeah, so that, that part was, was really nice and seamless for me. Um, but I mean, there's still a thousand other characters I had to do, so it wasn't like that seamless, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. And um, so I, I, I was some, for some reason I was with or talking to Ashley Eckstein. I don't remember what was going on, but she was like, did, did they call you about the book? And I was like, no, they didn't. Um, what are you talking about? And she was like, oh, there's a Padme book. And I was, she was like, they haven't called you? And then I was like, no, they haven't. And it was kind of like, and, and I'm like thinking like, wait, are they going to do a Padme book? Yeah. And they're not going to, do they know that I do it? Our hearts are just so wrapped up in these people, you know, it's, it's like a big deal to us. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's what it was. And they, they, they were planning, I found out later. They just hadn't contacted me, but yeah, I mean, so having played her for, for 10 years now and also getting to explore her so, so much more deeply in the Clone Wars than in the movies, um, I just feel like I know her. Mm -hmm. So it was, it's always, people always say, like, what's it like picking, you know, the headdress back up and picking the role back up? And it's like, I don't ever feel like I put it down. So This I, is the theme of your life. Star Wars has always been there. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. And... Uh, and, uh, and the queen and the senator is just like a part of me. So I'm like any Padme content anyone wants to do. I'm like, you, you know, a little skit at a supermarket, Padme's in it, <laughs> I will be there, so. <laughs> Gina, and you also, Gina and you and Kevin were in uh, From a Certain Point of View as well. Yeah. Kevin wrote a story and you narrated it. Yeah. Um, yeah, because uh, you had just done Battlefront. Yep. And we, we wanted to get you involved. I was like, oh my God, they asked me to do something. <laughs> Maybe it didn't suck, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, that was so cool to get that call. Um, you guys know this book, right? Or this series? Yeah, 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 yeah. It was such a cool idea that you guys had to... Um, there's so many of these, like micro moments throughout the galaxy and to be able to have brilliant writers unpack them is just it was very it was very fun and of course you know coming from an imperial point of view was very easy for me <laughs> uh, um, that's why that's actually why we I feel like that's that why you and I you. are a really good match yeah exactly yeah yeah and Kevin's really was a micro moment your, your story really was a micro moment Yes, so um, Time of Death is um, Obi-Wan's literal moment when the lightsaber goes shoom. Um, and the, the story came from the idea that if your life flashes um, before your eyes at the moment of death, what does that mean for a Jedi who's going into the Force? And so it gave us the chance to have Obi-Wan throughout his life as, as old Ben um, and also um, just being on Tatooine and watching Luke grow up and not being able to talk, go anywhere near him. So to wrap up as like sort of in our last question or so, I, I'll, I'll take my notes because I want to ask you guys, you've done what you've done and now as more stories come out of a galaxy far, far away, mm -hmm. what do you want to come back to do? Is there a character, oh. um, is there a character <laughs> you want to flex into? Is there a time period you want to flex into? <laughs> Man. Um, no, I know. That I, I, I'm, I, I'm <laughs> springing this one on them. I didn't. It's not even fair. But, but just that sense of like, you know, it could be something like neither of you have read Yoda or neither of you have played Obi-Wan Kenobi. So like, mm. is, is, like is there a, a particular area of your fandom that you sort of like want to flex in? The Rebel Alliance, for instance. I can say um, uh, that there's definitely like I so some of the Twi'leks that I've played Mission Vet and then um, Numa from Clone Wars and Rebels, I really would love to see something that explored those characters and even maybe um, connected them. A lot of people suspect that they're connected, um, and I think that that would be really cool. 
and uh, and I also have already said, you know, obviously any more handmade and stuff like Sabe would a story would be so great. But I always say that I do still hold out hope that it was actually a decoy in the funeral and that Padme is alive and she's been watching everything the whole time and like in like movie 21 she comes back and she's been like she's been orchestrating all of it the whole time oh yeah so i'm just saying it could happen um i mean i'm gonna make some notes <laughs> i know that's I'm good have that's drinks good. later and i'm gonna like we're gonna flush the story out so um i'm listen i'm still obsessed with Aiden and um you know she spoiler has uh switches sides and um the thing that i talked to sammy <laughs> but the thing that i love and we didn't get to really explore a lot is she didn't want to and there's a whole lifetime when she switches where that we don't cover in the game where she's like i'm a rebel now Ugh. <laughs> like she just sort of hates it so um you know they're like the, first of all, the Imperials know how to run shit, okay? <laughs> they know how to keep things in order, and they figured out some process, processes of doing these things. Um, and I think she, I mean, I know she misses the way that it smells when her TIE fighter gets hit. You know, like the way the metal melts a little bit, and she misses it, you know, but she's like, now she's on the rebel side, and she's like, no, I know this is the right thing to do, but my God, do I miss it, you know? Uh, and I really would love to explore uh, her life during the years when she's like, I know I'm doing the right thing, but I, I, I miss my, my, my origins, yeah. I'd like to thank these guys for joining me up here today. I'd like to thank you guys for coming, thank you. Thank you, thanks for coming, guys. <laughs>